Okay, why is it called a Yom Tif? We know Rosh Hashanah is a Yom Tif, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Pesach, Shavuos. Where do we suddenly have this new Yom Tif of today? First of all, what is today? Today is the Hebrew date in the Jewish calendar of Yud Tes Kislev. Yud Tes is 19, the 19th day of Kislev. And it is a Yom Tiv. Not only is it considered by Hasidim all over the world a Yom Tiv, a special day, but in fact, it's called a Reish Hashanah to Hasidus. Not only a Yom Tiv, but the very prime day, it is actually the Reish Hashanah, the new year. And just like the new year just doesn't just mean it's a new year, it means it is the day. And the word Reish means head, that from this day, this day infuses the entire year with the spirituality of the day of Reish Hashanah. So when we say it is Reish Hashanah, the new year of Hasidis, it is telling us that the entire year is infused with the Hasidic spirituality, the spirituality that Hasidis, Hasidus as the teachings of and conduct of one conducting himself according to the teachings of Hasidus adds to his spirituality the whole year. And he takes this, it's derived from this day of Yutas Kislev, the Reish Hashan of Hasidus. And that's why we say Gut Yom Tif. Why is this the beginning of the year for Hasidus? Because this, the day of the 19th day of Kislev, was the day when the Alter Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe, the first so-called Lubavitch Rebbe, was released from prison. Uh, why he was incarcerated, why he was in prison, that's a whole long story that I'm not going to go into now. Basically, it was a libel from those that were opposed to the Hasidic movement, both from those that were non-religious, were against religion, together with those that were very religious because they were afraid that the new Hasidic movement would somehow lead people astray from Judaism. This wasn't long after there were two false messiahs, both of these false messiahs, Shabzai Tzvi and uh, Pesach Frank, all started with teaching or basing their revelations, so to speak, on the teachings of Kabbalah, but they really led many, many Jews astray from true Judaism and they converted. It was a very, very sad time in Jewish history. So many people were very, very weary of any new movement in Judaism. And uh, that is one reason also they were afraid that this new movement of Hasidis was to a degree diminishing the power and the respect of the big Torah scholars. At that time, in those years, in Europe, especially in Eastern Europe, when the Jewish community was very, very poor, most of the Jews did not have an opportunity to go and learn Torah. And so there was a great chasm, a great gap between the scholars, the few Torah scholars, and uh, what's called the Am Ha'aretz, the mass majority of the people that really were not able to learn on any profound le level whatsoever. And this gap and this superior feeling from the scholars was something that was strongly felt by the masses and uh, they felt that they really are not contributing and don't have much to contribute to Judaism, that their service of God is really very, very limited because of their limited scholarship. They were very sincere Jews in prayer and charity and going, doing good deeds and fulfill, fulfilling the commandments as much as they're able to, but scholarship was sorely lacking. And this gap, as we said, was emphasized by many of the scholars themselves who looked down very strongly on the masses. One of the teachings that Hasidis started, and this began with the Baal Shem Tov, the originator of the Hasidic movement to a degree. The word, the name Baal Shem Tov means the master of the good name, that these were great tzaddikim, very holy people that were able to use 
God's name to bring down blessings on people, and therefore they were called Baal Shem Tov. There were a number of such individuals. The leader of our Hasidic movement was Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, and he emphasized the fact that God, Rachman Oliba Bo'i, it is not scholarship that makes a person close to God, but his feelings and his actions and sincerity and God's love for a relatively simple Jew who never had the opportunity to study is nothing less and at times even greater than the feeling of a scholar who's more into himself than into being connected to God. So this was another reason why many of the scholars were very weary, weary of this new Hasidic movement, which seemed to them to de-emphasize scholarship. And so they brought a libel to the Russian government, to the czars, saying that the al Rebbe was, uh, was revolting against the government. He was assisting Turkey that was then at war with Russia by sending them money. And uh, this was a very, very serious charge besides the charge that he's constantly speaking against the government and the Al-Tarebbe was incarcerated for a period of 53 days. And he, during this time, he had time to explain to them what all of his views are. And on the 19th day of Kislev, he was completely exonerated. So it became what is called a Yom Tif. What is really the significance of a Yom Tif, of a special day? Are we just commemorating something that happened years ago, or does it have a relevance to now? We find there are words in the Megillah. In the story of Purim, you have what's called the Megillah's Esther, the scroll that Esther and Mordechai, the main hero and heroines, besides all of the Jewish people that were heroes, that they wrote down the entire story of Purim. And we find over there the words, Hayomim Ha'elu, these days that we are commemorating, Niskarim, they are remembered, which is logical. But then it says also, Vinasim, they are done. In other words, they are not just reenacted, but they are happening again. What exactly does that mean? And that explanation really brings us to the essence of what is a Yom Tif and what is a Shabbos. Those days, Shabbos and Yom Tif are called in the Torah Mikroi Kodesh. They are assemblies of holiness. What exactly does it mean? It doesn't just mean that it's a holy day because we're commemorating something or we're doing something. It means that there is a holiness in the world. Meaning what? As we will discuss quite a lot in the Tanya, our world is really a world that is hiding the truth, is hiding the essence of godliness, is hiding the fact that everything that exists is really an extension of godliness that is giving life to everything else. You take away the godliness that is constantly giving life to everything, and there is nothing. Whatever is here is because God's word is coming down in, at times in a physicality, like our world, at times in a higher spiritual level, which isn't so physical, but it's still some type of a reality other than God. Angels and other higher spiritual worlds, as we'll learn more about later in Tanya. So most of the time, this godliness is concealed from us. When I look around, I see physicality. I see a tree. I don't see the word of God that is actually making this tree in existence. If somebody were to have the true insight and realize that what he sees is just the word of God, whatever he looks at will be to him a representation of godliness. As the story goes that the al Rebbe, that the first Chabad Rebbe, the one who wrote the Tanya, he was once speaking 
with his son, and he said, what contemplation do you contemplate when you're davening, which is how you connect yourself to God? And he'd said, this high Kabbalistic thought, this high Kabbalistic thought, and the Alter Rebbe said, I am davening with my shtender, with the lectern, this the wooden table, the lectern that is holding my siddur. In other words, if he looked at the lectern, it was a piece of wood, but what he saw was not the physicality of the wood, but in it, he saw this is God making this thing be here in existence. So most of the time, or for all of us, like practically all of the time, godliness is concealed. We see a physical world. On a day which is called a Mikrash Kodesh, a holy day, a day of Shabbos, a, gay, a day of Yontif, these are days when literally the world is on a higher spiritual level. And the godliness that pervades the world is more evident than it is the rest of the days, the regular mundane days of the week. Do we sense it all? Usually no. A person on a higher stature actually could sense it. They actually feel it. As the, and everybody to a sense also, even though they're not so aware of it. The Talmud tells us an interesting thing that even in Am Ha'aretz, meaning a non-educated person, a, re a relatively simple individual who did not study Kabbalah, does not know how to learn so much, is not aware even of the fact that Shabbos is a more special day, that there is innately in him more of awareness of godliness and God. It says even such an individual does not say a lie. In other words, something within him, consciously or not, changes. He is on a higher state of elevation, of spiritual awareness. And this is called a neshama yeseira, an additional soul that he has on Shabbos. What do we mean an additional soul? We don't have two souls running in us, but our soul is different. It is a strengthened spiritual soul, a strengthened awareness. That is one of the reasons for the custom that we have, that when we say Havdole, the prayer that we say when Shabbos exits at the end, at the conclusion of the Shabbat, when we make Havdalah, which literally means a prayer when we are saying goodbye, we are parting. One of the rituals that we do is, besides holding up our nails, to and holding a, a multi-wicked candle and holding up our fingers. There's different reasons for that. What we also do is we smell and we make a blessing over good smelling spices, cloves or something like that. And the reason is just like we find that if a person faints, how can we revive him by holding a strong smelling substance under his nose? And this literally revives his soul, it revives the life within him. It fainting is a lessening of his life force, and this brings it back. The same way, being that at the conclusion of Shabbos or Yontif, the special soul, meaning the additional godly awareness of our soul, departs. It is a weakening of our soul. So in a sense, we are reviving the soul that is left with the so-called smelling salts or making the blessing. So that's the idea of a yumtif. It is not just something commemorating, but it's actually a reenactment and it's a rehappening of the spiritual force. So being that the day of Yutes Kislev in a sense was really the beginning of the enabling of the teaching of Hasidus in the manner that we have it now publicly and openly and with an expansiveness in a sense that we can understand really what we're saying, that the normal person can understand these concepts, that was the beginning, that was the empowerment of it, and therefore it is called the yantiv because each time that a yutes kisav comes around, again it is an empowerment for the ability and capability to learn Hasidus and to inculcate these thoughts that becomes part of who we are. So why and what is the connection? 
with Hasidis, with all of this. We find a very, very interesting story that took place even before the Alter Rebbe started, wrote the Tanya and started his Hasidic movement. It really happened when he was a student during the time of his teacher, Rav Dov Ber of Mizrich, who was the student that followed the Baal Shem Tov. He took over after the Baal Shem Tov, really a year after Baal Shem Tov passed away. He took over the leadership of the Hasidim at the request of the soul of the Baal Shem Tov, and he began teaching Hasidis. Now, there was a lot of opposition to the teachings of the secrets of the Torah, which is what Hasidis and Kabbalah is. So there was a lot of opposition, certainly on earth, different scholars, and there were very few scholars that learned Kabbalah, because the majority of the scholars just learned what's called Nigla, the revealed parts of Torah, the Talmud, and law, and not the esoteric teachings, but also in heaven, in other words, in the higher spiritual realms, which is really what controls everything that happens here on earth, there was also opposition because the secrets of the Torah were really intended to be secret. Somebody to learn these very, very lofty ideas that connects the soul of a Jew to God and can elevate him to such a level was meant to be learned by people that were on a very high spiritual level, that they were really able to deal with these concepts and internalize it and act upon it. And you had to be on a certain spiritual level. Being that not everybody was on such a level, some of the scholars here below and many of the powers in heaven, angels and stuff like that, were against it. And so there was in heaven also what's called a kithru, in opposition against these teachings of heavenly heavenly Torah of Kabbalah. We find something similar to that is brought down in the Talmud, that when Moses wanted to give the Torah to the Jewish people on Mount Sinai, and Moses ascended Mount Sinai when Hashem said, Alei el hahar, come up to the mountain and you will be given the Torah there, literally, Moshe Rabbeinu ascended in the spiritual sense into the heaven. And the angels came, and they said, what is a human being doing here? He's here to take the Torah. What right does a human being have for the Torah? They said to God, your glory, the Torah belongs in heaven. And Moshe Rabbeinu saw these angels that were in such a high spiritual state, it could have consumed him. And he said to Hashem, I can't answer them, I'm afraid. Hashem said, in a sense, exactly what this means, we don't understand, hold on to my throne and answer them. In other words, you'll be spiritual enough to confront them. And Moshe Rabbeinu did so, he answered and he gave reasons why the Torah does in fact belong to human beings on earth and not to angels, and he succeeded and he was able to have the Torah brought down to this world. Kabbalah, there was also such an opposition in heaven and therefore, there was a kitrug. So the story goes that one time, one of the students of the Mizricher Magid, the disciple of the Baal Shem Tov, saw a page of very, very deep Hasidic thought, of Kabbalistic thought, that was literally on the floor. And to him, this was like seeing a Sefi Torah on the floor. And he said, this comes from our teaching it. He himself was the disciple of the Magid, but he was still very, very severe in his attitude. And he says, this is what comes from teaching and disseminating these deep thoughts to everyone that it's just lying literally on the ground. Look what you're doing to it. The holiest of holy is lying on the ground. And so it says that the Alter Rebbe, knew that he has to placate this student who wasn't just a student, he was also a very great holy person, a very great tzaddik. 
And the Alter Rebbe knew that the kepeda, the anger of this great tzaddik, this righteous person against the disseminating of Kabbalah and Hasidis on a mass scale can have an effect in heaven. What a person does here reflects what happens in heaven. And therefore he knew he had to placate him and explain it to him. So he told him the following example. And he said that there was a king there was a king who had one son who was naturally the love of his life. And this son was going to take over the kingdom. This son was showered with all the love that the father had for a ben yochid, for an only child. One day, the child became very, very sick. They called naturally the best doctors in the land. And when none of them were able to heal him, they called the greatest professors from out of the country, anything to try and heal the king's only son. Nothing helped. Finally, one doctor, one professor came and he said, I know what will heal the king's son. The king said, sure, anything. Professor said, I don't know if you're ready to do it. The king, what do you said? What do you mean I won't do it? This is my son. This is everything. Of course, I'll do it. What do I have to do? So the professor doctor said, in the king's crown, the main stone, the most precious stone in the king's crown, which is a crown that was handed, handed down from the kings for many, many generations. And this large stone was the whole glory and beauty of the crown. This stone has medicinal value in it. And if you take out this stone, pulverize it, grind it up into a powder, mix it with a liquid and give it to your son, I think this is going to help him. So the king recoiled, said, wait a second. This is not something that I'm able to give away. This isn't just my crown. This was the crown of all of the kings before me, all of my ancestors. This is the whole glory of the kingdom. I don't know. Maybe we can find something else that is not going to destroy this great treasure, my most precious, my most precious object. And so they continued looking for a doctor, but the situation with the king's son just deteriorated and he was almost comatose. He called this professor, he says, okay, do it. Take my crown, take the crown jewel in the crown, pulverize it, make it into a liquid, and I will give it to my son and this will help him. The doctor said, it may be too late. It could be that the child is even incapable of ingesting anything. And if I pulverize it and make it and mix it with a liquid, I'll try and put it into the child's mouth. I don't know if anything will enter the mouth or anything will enter into his throat or anything will enter into the stomach and make, make him better. It might be a waste. And the king said, I don't care. When I realized that this is the only thing that can save my son, Nothing is more valuable than that. My whole kingdom is for him and therefore do it. And the Alter Rebbe said to this Chaber, to his fellow student who was such a great tzaddik, who was so angry about the words of Kabbalah laying on the ground. And he says, this is what Hasidus is. It is the crown jewel of Hashem, it is the crown jewel of God's Torah, which is in essence, one with Hashem. And Hashem says, take this crown jewel and let it try to be instilled in every single Jew. The Jews at that time, especially this was after what was known as the Xeris Tachvetat, the, the Chemlinitsky pogroms that decimated hundreds of thousands of Jews and countless Jewish communities. The Jews were very, very poor, very downtrodden, and this had a terrible effect on their observance, and they were being, they were being lost. And so the Alter Rebbe said, Hashem says, take the greatest teachings, the greatest depths of Torah, which is myself, which is the essence of godliness, and let it be disseminated to the masses. This hopefully will save them and renew 
their life will bring back the life and the love and the vitality of Judaism into them. This placated, this uh, placated that Pinchas Kodesh said, this gave him to understand that the fact that a piece of Kabbalah was literally on the floor has a purpose, it has a reason, and this took away his anger, and it averted at that time the decree from that might have happened. Years later, when the Al Terebe was teaching Hasidis, he wrote down the ideas of Tanya, and he says, these ideas of Tanya, in fact, were not meant to be written down. These were words of spiritual encouragement and advice and instruction that he gave to his followers. But as we will learn later, because of two main reasons, first of all, people forget what he taught them. There were so many people, so many Hasidim, and therefore he didn't have time to see each one individually. And also many individuals wrote down the words of the Tanya that the Alter Rebbe gave out in pamphlets, just the different Hasidim, and they had copies, not printed, he never intended to print it. But people, the opposite, the opponents to Hasidim took these writings and they forged them and inserted different ideas that were an anathema to true Judaism that showed a heresy in them. Because of that, as we will see later, the Alter Rebbe said, the time has come, even though it's not my way and it's not what I wanted, to print it. He asked a number of his fellow tzaddikim, very, very great scholars and very holy individuals, should he do it? They encouraged him, and that is when it was given in to print. Uh, okay, we didn't really start the text, being that is the day of Yutas Kislev. Let me read a little bit of what's called the Sharblat, the introductory page, which in itself was written by the Alt Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe, Rabshner Zalman of, of Liadi, as he was also called. And the, say, the first words begin with Sefer Likutei Amorim, a book which is simply a gathering of sayings. In the Alter Rebbe's humility, he doesn't say, hey, I am writing down some original thoughts, something that are going to transform the Jewish world completely, innovative words. He says, no. I just gathered some sayings and some teachings from previous forum, from previous uh, holy books, and from previous teachers of mine, nothing original. But in fact, what he compiled and how he compiled the whole thing was amazing. And we will continue, Mir Hashem, with God's help next week. Thank you.